Before you type out a single comment about this hat, first of all, how dare you? My mom made this. <laughs> It wasn't a slow news week, but it's definitely been a crummy news week. A lot of, a lot of bad news this week. I'm trying to think of some way to make it fun, I do find it interesting still how video game companies choose to deliver bad news on their own terms. Because it happens a lot. It happens so much you just, you, there's a pattern to it. You just sort of get used to it. But what's exciting is when they delineate from that pattern. When things go differently, it pops. It becomes exciting. Like a firework going off in church. Let me give you an example of a straight up regular bad news announcement. The Star Wars Jedi Survivor is delayed just six weeks? That's barely bad news. But the funny thing is, this kind of thing still needs to come with a very long post. And look at this bad boy. For a six week delay. It follows this formula. First, the good news. The game is feature complete. The game's ready to go, is what that means. It means you could play it today, but you would have a bad time. The next six weeks are going to be focused on bug fixes to enhance performance, stability, polish, and most importantly, the player experience. Okay, and then there's this one long paragraph to make you excited about the game. It's all fluff. Ignore this. You can usually skip the second paragraph of any of these posts. The third paragraph is the bad news. And we don't get what we came to this post for until this spot right here, April 28th. And then finally, a chunk dedicated to giving thanks. May the force be with you. And that's the regular formula. Take what could have been one sentence and stretch it out into a long, boring, short essay. That's just the normal thing to do. But that wasn't it for Respawn this week. Along with the secret cancellation of a single-player Titanfall slash Apex Universe game, there came the public cancellation of Apex Legends Mobile this very same week. And you're telling me I've never heard of Apex Legends before? What is that? I'm telling you, iPhone Game of the Year 2022, buddy. So EA announced that Apex Legends Mobile and Battlefield Mobile will both be discontinued soon with these little blurbs. Look at these nice, compact little blurbs. But Apex Legends Mobile is the big one. Battlefield Mobile it only gets that blurb. There's nothing on their website about this closure at all. <laughs> Apex Legends Mobile gets their own post from Respawn. And I find this phrasing so interesting. Following a strong start, the content pipeline for Apex Legends Mobile has begun to fall short of that bar for quality, quantity, and cadence. It is for this reason, after months of working with our development partner, that we have made the mutual decision to sunset our mobile game. Their development partner is never named anywhere in that post. This is positioned to be a mutual sunset decision between us and the people we were paying to make this, who we will not mention in this moment. If you are curious, it's this long list of names. It's Lightspeed Studios, which is a subsidiary of Tencent. So they're just out here saying, we don't like how good this game is. It's not up to our standards. We're shutting it down. And then always end with a chunky thanks. Now, Rumbleverse is a wild one. Also, just this week, Epic Games, who was the publisher, Iron Galaxy, who was the developer, they announced that their Battle Royale Brawler, which they had just officially launched just in August, and I thought was relatively popular, will be going offline at the end of February. Unlike the announcement of Apex Legends Mobile's closure, there is nothing in this entire post that explains or alludes to or even hints at why this game is going offline. It's just meant to be understood, I guess. And this is kind of epic gamesy big money crazy. Is that because because this game's lifespan was so short, they're willing to refund any money anyone spent on this game at any time. Go ahead, we make Fortnite. It's not gonna hurt us. Now look at this thing. If you're curious about our future plans, check out the open letter to the community 
on the Iron Galaxy blog. And this post is even weirder. Go ahead and control F Epic Games. You'll find nothing. This post, presumably written by the same Iron Galaxy dev team, is meant to be a more personal note. However, it also shines no more light into the reason why this game is going offline. Never mentioned. In fact, paragraph four says this. It is our sincerest hope that this news does not mark the end of Rumbleverse. You may not yet have seen the rumble in its final form. If we can welcome people back onto the deck of the Battle Barge again, we hope you'll be there, laced up and ready to take your rightful place in the canon. Presumably a lot of that would make sense to somebody who enjoys Rumbleverse. But my inference here is that this was perhaps also not a mutual sunset decision. Maybe Iron Galaxy feels a different way about this game's closure than Epic Games does. And maybe Iron Galaxy is going to try to get publishing rights? Who knows? This is just, I'm, maybe I'm reading too much and that's just, that's just what I'm picking up. It ends with this. Our customary thanks. And then, this is not the last time you'll hear from us. This is not the last time we'll invite you to play. I'm getting chills. This is easily the best bad news delivery of the week. In this post, they're presenting a mystery. They're presenting inherent intrigue. What are they up to? What are they planning? I'm invested now. I didn't care what Iron Galaxy was doing three days ago. Now I'm fully rooting for them. And that's delayed input for this week. Thanks for watching. Now, I do realize there's a little bit of hypocrisy in making fun of how every single one of those posts ends with a thank you. And then here I am ending every single video every single week with the exact same thank you. Like, even if I am genuinely grateful to you, which I am, does it even come across if it happens the exact same way, the exact same time, every single opportunity I have? Does it register at all to you? Does it just look like air? I don't, I don't even know. It might be time to mix it up. May the force be with you. This next story was part of the original script this week, but I was looking over everything I had written and it just seemed like this episode is a lot of reading. I felt bad about it. I felt like, you know, you know, you want, I just want to show trailers and people double jumping. This, this one's just like a lot of check out these articles. But anyway, I did, I got more bonus bad news. Please enjoy. This one is really fun. This bad news comes from the ESA, which is the Entertainment Software Association. It's the U.S. lobbyist group that video game companies pay to make sure that laws are passed favorably for video game companies. But the reason I know of them is that they also happen to be the company that historically runs E3. IGN ran this article. Exclusive! Xbox, Nintendo, and Sony won't be part of E3 2023. Now, it's not particularly shocking news, right? I can't, there's not much I could say about it because it's mostly stuff you would have already predicted. IGN does have a source who says that uh, ReadPop, the company running it, doesn't really have their stuff together, or just at least that the information flow hasn't been great. So one day later, the ESA wrote an email to all of its members, which was never meant to be public, by the way. IGN almost immediately obtained it and then spun out a new headline. ESA responds to IGN's E3 2023 reports. Reviving show was always going to have its challenges. So it's wild. It's, it's the ESA responding to IGN's articles directly to its members. It starts like this. As you have likely seen, IGN published an article last night about E3. I just love that the presumption is that once everybody gets home from work, they open up their iPads and go to IGN.com to check the news. But absolutely no part of IGN's report is refuted in this memo. ReadPop, which is the enormous company that is running E3 this year, they also do other live events like PAX and Comic-Con, by the way. It's New York Comic-Con that ReadPop does. 
I'm, I know it's not a, that's not a small Comic-Con, but also it's not the only one. And I feel like if you don't specify, people assume you're talking about San Diego Comic-Con. That's the big one, right? Here they're just like, yeah, these are the Comic-Con guys. Anyway, they made strong progress in reshaping the event and have received tremendous support from industry companies of all sizes who are not only thinking about E3 2023, but how E3 fits into marketing plans for 2024 and beyond. Remember, this is just going out to people who are already in the ESA, who are probably already talking to each other. And so the ESA is on their side saying, well, if this year stinks, we do. I mean, a lot of people are actually talking about next year and beyond. And finally, there's no hard feelings to Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft. It's important to note that even as this show evolves and adapts, it will not impact the core of ESA's work for its member companies. Our priority remains advocating for your policy interests on the state and federal level. I guess it's always worth remembering that the ESA is, first and foremost, not a cool video game event company, but a lobbyist group. And as always, you gotta give thanks in the final paragraph. And worth reiterating, not meant to be public, not meant to be an IGN article. This was simply the ESA talking to these video game companies who they hope will give them more money to be featured on the show floor for this show that they're trying to put together. If not this year, maybe next year. It's good stuff.